It had hair all over its body other than the face itself. There are in fact four different types of, uh, you know, what we think of as Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Very wide, pronounced nose. There was also a very ominous uh, odor. Phase one is to identify opportunities. I walked into a small clearing uh, and less than 10, 15 feet away from uh, this enormous creature and uh, it scared the living hell out of me. Phase two is conducting investigations both of witnesses and locations. The size of the thing, it was, you know, four or five feet across the shoulders. Phase three is profiling research areas, what's there, how they move, feeding, things like that. About eight feet tall, I guessed around 800 pounds, it was massive. I had no idea that anything like that existed. Phase four is create an intercept plan. I decided to shoot in the air to see if maybe it would scare it off. Phase 5 is the intercept and resolve the issue phase. It didn't do anything, didn't react, and then I heard a noise from my right rear and from out behind some brush come another one and walked over by the first one. That's when I decided to do what the dog did, I took off running. Welcome to Witness of the Unknown. Most often we think of uh, witnesses of Bigfoot encounters as just the average person out hiking or hunting or, or whatever reason somebody's out in the forest. Uh, and oftentimes people don't pay a lot of attention to that, unfortunately. But it's when people in official capacities have these encounters that we tend to pay a little more attention because they're trained observers. Uh, and that's what we have today. Uh, our guest is Jack. Jack has a, uh, is a retired military, special forces. Uh, he also did law enforcement work with the Army and is a current police officer. So, Jack, welcome to the show. Hi. Uh, I guess I'll let you talk about your background a little bit if you want to uh, fill people in to sort of give them an idea of your, uh, your extensive you know, training and experiences. All right. Uh, uh, I joined the Army in 1987. Uh, spent uh, uh, five years as uh, as a regular infantryman. Uh, uh, went through selection and assessment. Uh, got picked up with uh, Special Forces. Went to 5th Group. Uh, I was in 5th Group for three years. Uh, during my training, um, uh, at the end of that, I ended up, uh, having a bad jump and was hung in the door. And, uh, in order to, to maintain special forces status, uh, you have to be airborne qualified. Well, I wasn't at that point, wasn't willing to jump out of any more airplanes. <laughs> I can imagine. So, <laughs> so, uh, you know, they, uh, I had a pretty good, uh, I had a pretty good, uh, uh, battalion commander i went and talked to him about it and and uh he said well i'll give you a month to go find a new job so i ended up uh uh had to carouse around fort campbell trying to trying to get an idea what i wanted to do because they were they were willing to even reclass me and do a whole new mos um uh, and a friend of mine had told me to go to uh go talk to the uh third detachment uh uh cid group right there at Fort Campbell. And, and so I did, uh, one thing led to another within, uh, not even a, a week of talking to them. I was, uh, already transferred over to their, their MTO. I was on their books. They carried me as one of their, uh, augmentees, uh, waiting a school date. Uh, so I spent uh, better part of a month and a half, almost two months, uh, 
learning about CID agents from the agents themselves before I went to the school. And then I ended up going to Fort McClellan, uh, went through uh, CID school there before they closed McClellan down. Uh, after that, I ended up uh, doing a rotation in Korea, uh, came back, um, uh, did another rotation at Fort Campbell, ended up going to Fort Story, Virginia. Uh, I was the I was the only resident uh, CID agent on post, so uh, not that we had uh, infinite amounts of crime that was happening within the Virginia Beach area, but uh, every now and again I'd get bored because not much happened on Fort Story. It was it was about the about the size of five city blocks, so I'd I'd run down to Virginia Beach PD and and carouse with them. I'd I'd do a lot of. Uh, 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 concurrent jurisdictional work with them. Uh, now, uh, for for listeners who don't know, you know, aren't familiar with the military, CID is, and I see if I, my memory is good, Criminal Investigative Division. That's it. Okay, that's it. Uh, then I ended up doing a rotation up at Fort Belvoir uh, as a uh, PSD agent, uh, which is Protective Service Detail. Uh, from there, I ended up uh, coming back to Virginia Beach. Met my ex-wife. Um, uh, we got married there in, in Virginia, uh, and then we decided to move back to Texas. Did a rotation at Las Colinas. Did a rotation with the 425th CID uh, detachment out of uh, Grand Prairie. Uh, did a little bit of undercover work, but a lot of my uh, a lot of my expertise was protective service detail. Um, that's what they like to do with uh, uh, certain detachments is they'll list them under uh, different battalions. And my detachment was, uh, fortunately, I was listed under the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the PSB battalion, which is Protective Service Battalion. So uh, every about every year we get a we get a anywhere between a six week to a six month. Uh, protective service detail rotation we'd have to do and I'd, I'd end up going back to Belvoir and, and spend six months there. Uh, did a rotation in Iraq in 2003, did a rotation in uh, Iraq again in 2005, did a rotation in uh, Afghanistan in 2009 and 10. Uh, I was deployed uh, to uh, Desert Storm in, in 1990, they sent me back. My dad had gotten killed. Uh, and then in uh, 1993, I ended up doing a rotation over in uh, in uh, uh, Somalia. I was, uh, a matter of fact, I was on the airfield when uh, the Rangers were hit in Mogadishu. So, so it's fair to say you you've got a fair amount of uh, combat experience. In your exactly, life. and and my rotation in. Uh, in Mogadishu was with fifth group. It wasn't with CID. Uh, my rotations in 2003 and four, 2005 and six and 2009 and 10, uh, was with CID. So, uh, you know, I've got uh, combat arms, combat time, and I've got combat service and support time, which is, that's what they list CID and, and the MPs is combat service and support. Right. Right. So you, you retired out of the Army as a Master yep. Sergeant. And <clears throat> so you decided to carry on and, and go into civilian police work. Exactly. Right? Uh, and, and it's kind of odd because I actually retired in 2008 uh, with 21 years and some months. And uh, within six months' time, I was recalled back to service. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know a few people that have been called. Yeah, that. and uh, and it was only supposed to be a one year rotation. It ended up being three years because it got blown up in Afghanistan. So uh, well, that's that's how the army yeah, works. I, so. I, I, <laughs> I, you know, I, nobody got hurt on those IED explosions, but uh, you know, I kind of looked at my boss and I said, "Jesus Christ, y'all ain't happy enough that I actually made it out with all ten toes, ten fingers, and three <laughs> testicles." And he kind of looked at me like. <laughs> <laughs> so uh you know it, you got to have a sense of humor if you're going to spend any amount of time in the military cuz if you take it serious all the time you'll end up pulling your hair out so well i i i can identify i remember uh have when i was a staff sergeant in the army 
uh, we were in a, on, on our way somewhere in a do, two and a half ton truck and uh, one of the other sergeants made a comment about he was having some go around with one of the privates and he says you know all the unemployed comedians are in the army yeah. <laughs> and, and i thought you know he's right <laughs> everybody everybody's a uh, uh sam kennison in the army now it's yeah that's for it, sure you know, and, the, and the sad thing is is that the, the drill sergeants are leading the way in that you got to be about a half-ass stand-up comic just to be a good drill sergeant and Oh, I, I again, I can identify. I spent a couple years as a drill myself. So let's let's go ahead and talk about um, now during the course of, of regular police work. Um, so you you've done that a fair number of years now, also, yes. right? Yeah, I've got uh, during that time. Oh, go ahead. I got go better ahead. Uh, between the two. Uh, uh, federal and, and local, I've got I got a little better than twenty years experience. So, and and the reason this is important is I, I want listeners to understand that you know between your combat arms experience, because I was combat arms, I understand that background. Anybody who is or was in the military will understand this also. Uh, you know, it sort of it sort of changes you from before you go in the military when you go through that kind of training. Uh, your outlook is definitely, I, I would say, steadied. In other words, you don't just do a knee-jerk reaction when things confront you, you know, that you rely back on that training. And in your case, of course, you know, you have, have extensive combat experience and working as a, uh, a law enforcement investigator, both the military and then now as a police officer. So what's important about that is the things we're going to be talking about have a direct bearing on that. Well, that's true. Um, because a lot of people, when they when they have experiences with these creatures, uh, you know, as an investigator with this particular subject, I have to uh, I have to sort of put on different glasses and how I view what people tell me, you know, and then try to learn about their backgrounds and such. So I kind of have a better idea of where their perspective is on what it was they experienced, but. Yours is, is a very well and heavily trained and experienced background as an investigator. So it's very important when someone like you talks about what they have seen and experienced because it's from a very well trained and experienced exactly. background. Exactly. Well, and that's, uh, that, I think that's some of the problem with the, the general naysayers. They don't take into account that the a good portion of the people that are that are making these reports are people that have to pay attention to detail, uh, military firefighters, uh, EMT technicians, uh, any sort of first response. Yeah. You know, mainly first responders and they have everything to lose and nothing to gain. This is true. Yeah, exactly. Because that could be a, a professional death knell. Uh, you know, if, if say you were to go out and publicly talk about, uh, you know, the things you've seen and experienced, uh, you know, that could be uh, professional. Care. Yeah, exactly. And that's, uh, you know, it, it, there's a running joke within the military itself. You know, if, if you hadn't got the gallows humor after your first couple of years in military, you, you'll get it shortly thereafter. And then there's a lot. Of yeah, this is true. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a whole lot of truth to that. So, so now, Let's move forward. Um, now, during the course of your, your police duties, uh, how did you first come into contact with the subject of Bigfoot? Well, I, really, the, the my first contact was when I was a, a young boy. I was about 13 years old. Uh, me and my younger brother, Gerald Lee, went to go spend a couple of weeks at my aunt's house up in uh, north central Texas. And, uh, you know, we, we go up there uh, and my cousin Forrest was just, he was tickled to death. He finally had, you know, two buddies to run around with and, and you know, between the frog gigging down at the dam at, at Lone Star Lake and, and, you know, just out there really kind of making fools out of ourselves at that young age, trying to have fun. Uh, you know, we decided one night that, you know, after dinner, we were going to go out and go gig frogs down by the dam. 
uh, you know, when you gig frogs, you, you really got to do it at night because that's usually the best time to, to catch your bigger frogs. And so uh, <clears throat> we're walking down this road, and, and on one side of us is a is a peach orchard. On the other side is a is a hay field, and and it's fenced off, and it's uh, this road kind of dead end in front of this general store. Uh, we're walking down towards the dam, which is the opposite direction of the general store, and and. Uh, you know, we, we get down a good piece, and we kind of look over to this other pasture that's right next to this this peach orchard, uh, and it's you know it's full of cattle, and and they're all kind of jumping around and raising hell, kind of acting like young calves do, and uh, sure. you know we're kind of giggling, you know what the hell's going on over there, and then about that time, that's when my my cousin Forrest stopped dead in his tracks, and uh, I brushed past him, and kind of look at him, I. Said, what the hell's the matter with you? You know, I thought maybe we were getting ready to walk up on a on a water moccasin or something, and, and he he just pointed. Of course, my brother Jerry stopped dead in his tracks too, and and where he pointed, I kind of turned around and looked, and I'm looking, and and all of a sudden you know, I see this shape. It was it was a pretty well lit night. It it was a full moon. Uh, I could see this shape, and it didn't quite register at first, and then all of a sudden this thing kind of stood up and it kept going up and up and up and up and uh we weren't but probably 30 40 feet from it uh and it was i couldn't get you any details but i could tell it was hairy it was really broad at the shoulders i mean broader than two men put together uh it didn't look like it had much of a neck uh and it just stood there and it was almost like it was standing kind of at a, a like a wide stance, like you'd see um, somebody that, that crouches down, you know, they're going to take a wider stance to support their weight. Well, it just sure. stood straight up from that. And, you know, wow. you know, over the years, I've tried to do that. You know, and that, that takes a tremendous amount of strength, even when I was 190 pounds. That took a tremendous amount of strength to stand up without any assistance from that that crouching position. Uh, right, um, right. And it just stood there and looked at us. And of course, we were froze. You know, three young boys between twelve and thirteen, uh, and we started walking backwards. Well, it started following us. <laughs> oh I mean, no! It, it, <laughs> Did you have any thoughts at the yeah, time? It, it we didn't know what to have. We weren't even. We were thinking like we we ran into the booger man. Um, oh boy! And you know, and before it really started following us, it actually walked out in the middle of the road. So, you know, that's when we started walking backwards, uh, and we start, you know, we get a good ways down back towards that general store because that's where we were going. Uh, there's a big street lamp right there in front of that general store, and last I heard that, you know, the people that owned the general store it had long since passed away, but but the general store's still there. And, uh, anyways, long story short, uh, we get within about a hundred yards of that street lamp and, uh, that's when it turned to its, to its right. And I mean, actually stepped over the fence going into that peach orchard and just took off. And it was, uh, it was the damnest thing I'd ever seen. How tall do you think the fence was? (sighs) You know, it was a four or five strand barbed wire fence. So it was. It was probably about four and a half feet tall, and it okay. just stepped right over top of it. I mean, didn't step on it, just stepped over top of it, uh, which was kind of, that was unnerving in itself because, you know, I've never seen even, the tallest guy I know is is uh, 7'3", and I don't think he could step over sure. something like that. Uh, wow. And as a matter of fact, uh, we stood there for about maybe a minute or two, just kind of in shock. Well, then we hauled ass to that general store, and we were banging on the door. Of course, at that, at that time of night, it was it was almost midnight. Uh, well, I take that back. I bet it was probably later than that. I bet it was I bet it was almost one o'clock in the morning, because by the time we got home that that uh, that evening, when my aunt come and picked us up, we didn't get to bed until almost two. So, and we didn't spend much time telling her what was going on. We just said we don't know what it was. Anyways banging on the door the the people finally woke up turned on their uh their porch light come out said we need to use your phone right now 
And they were good enough. They let us use the phone. We called my aunt, and she come picked us up. So <clears throat> next morning, we didn't wake up until almost like probably about 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we come stumbling downstairs, and my aunt said, uh, you need to go talk to the sheriff. And, of course, all us three boys kind of look at each other like, we didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, <laughs> she said, well, it, he, he actually stopped by and said, when y'all wake up, he wants to talk to y'all. So okay. So my aunt loaded us up in her, in her uh, station wagon, and we, you know, hauled butt down to the sheriff's office. And the and, uh, sheriff said, did y'all see anything unusual? And we told him what had happened. And he said, uh, well, here's the deal. We found three dead steers out in this pasture that you're describing. And all three of them had broke necks. And we just kind of looked at each other like, we didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> right. Well, they must have known, had some idea. Well, and, and, and shortly thereafter, uh, you know, I, me and my brother, Jerry Lee ended up going back home to South Texas and, and within two weeks of being home, my dad calls us into the kitchen and he says, you want to tell me what happened at your aunt's house? And we just kind of looked at each other going, well, not really. <laughs> 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 and my dad said, it's all right. You're not in trouble. I just need to find out what's going on. And I kind of looked at my dad. I said, why? And he said, well, your aunt's moving back home. She's leaving oh, a good job. So we want to, I want to know what, what happened up there. So we told my dad and, and he's like, okay. And then when my, my aunt got back to South Texas, she had told my dad the whole story of why she decided to leave. And, uh, part of it is, is because this woman broke down alongside the road and just up, just back, I think back towards the South from that general store is where the main highway was. This woman and her little boy, uh, in the middle of the night, broke down. Uh, so, you know, they weren't that far from town, uh, and it was within walking distance. Well, something happened to the woman that knocked her out, and the little boy got chased into a culvert. Oh, and, uh, you know, and now that I'm older, I kind of think about it. And, of course, that little boy, was he was cut up pretty good. Uh, um Sure. Because all kinds of garbage gets trapped in a in you know water runoff culverts. And, uh, right. Now right. that I'm older and I think about it, I'm like something had you know by the grace of God that the kid's lucky he didn't get bit by a snake. Yeah, because oh, culverts are just uh, they're notorious for having rattlesnakes and water moccasins in them. Well, apparently when. A deputy sheriff was driving past, seeing the car broke down, and then seeing the woman alongside the road like she was passed out. Woke her up. She's in hysterics. Where's my little boy? Where's my little boy? And it took them a couple hours to find him, but they found him in that culvert. But he was he was pretty well cut up. And my aunt was my aunt yeah. worked at uh, in the ER as a nurse, and and uh, when they brought that little boy in. She's like, okay, there's something to what the story that these boys told me, because this just isn't right. You know, nobody's going to chase a little boy did, in the middle of the night. Yeah. Did, do you think they may have told her some more details? That maybe yeah. More did, about it? <clears throat> apparently, the the woman couldn't say much, but the little boy just kept saying a big hairy man and a big hairy hand tried to pull him out of the culvert. And the kid was in hysterics when they finally got him out of the culvert. Yeah, um, and then the other thing that had happened was is that my aunt's neighbor had had some some he was pretty well known uh, along the circles of of coon hounds. You know, he, he raised black and tans and blue ticks. And uh, I mean, th this is a guy that that would advertise in magazines like Full Cry, selling hounds mm -hmm. to you know, everybody across the United States. Well, he had a, he had a, two broods that just mysteriously ended up disappearing. And these were, wow. you know, these weren't 18 week old pups. These were like five or six week old pups, but 
but that was a lot of money for him. That's how he, you know, pretty much made his living outside of, I, I forget where he worked, like the gas company or something. Uh, and that was, uh, he ended up losing that. Uh, and that was a chunk of change for him to lose, you know, and these were some prize winning hounds that produced these two broods and, and, uh, they're just gone. So, you know, that was a chunk of change for him. Yeah. At that sure. point, that's when my aunt decided to move back to South Texas. And, uh, you just too many things. Yeah, happening. it's it's too many things. And and the thing is, is that that year, I I, I distinctly remember that year, uh, because that was nineteen eighty eighty one, and we had a bad drought. Well, behind the dam of Lone Star Lake is a swamp. Used to be just a river bottom. Well, when they uh, mm -hmm. when they dammed up the the river, the, the they they basically created a, a giant swamp area, and uh, there's no telling what's behind that dam because it's just sure. miles and miles and miles of of river bottom that's that's now flooded, uh, and it's created a bunch of swamp land that you know I've talked to several people that have been from that area and they they said yeah it's there's no telling what's behind that swamp. You, you love to find, it. And, and that's something that's something locals don't. No, uh -uh, to, right? absolutely not. And there's really no reason to. You know, it, it, Lone Star Lake's not a big lake. It's it's more of a uh, water resource reservoir for for local area water storage. And there's really no reason. It's not like these. It's not like Southern Louisiana where. Uh, a lot of the people make their living off the off the swamps. It's that's not it. Uh, this is cattle country, sure. uh, and that's the that's the one thing that was so wild about it was is that this was totally out of the out of the ordinary and unexpected. Right, right. Well, let's go ahead and jump forward then. Now, <clears throat> so you you had an encounter growing up with these things. Um, now you and I have talked quite a bit. So I kind of want to start off with the, uh, you were on duty one night. Uh, this was just a couple of years ago, uh, with the, the older couple. Oh yeah. I got, I got called out on a, uh, on a suspicious person call and it was a, it was an older couple and in their eighties, uh, show up to the house, uh, guy, I guess that they had a, they had a broken window is what woke them up. Uh, they go in the kitchen, see that they got a broken window and there's, a, there's a rock there. Well, they see movement. And of course, uh, the old man, it's old Hispanic gentleman, uh, tells his wife to call, call nine one one thinking somebody's trying to break into the house. Well, he goes out on the porch to, to see if he can see who it is. And, uh, I mean, just gets out, past the door and that's when he noticed the thing standing right there you know in front of his porch and uh it took a swipe at him uh and it just he said it just missed him by inches uh and when he started explaining it to me he said it can't be real it can't be real and i kind of look at him and like yeah it, it's real <laughs> now you're thinking back to when exactly. you were a kid in your exactly. own experience right okay so so now when you took so you took that report and nothing happened really next? happened much after that uh, until after I was having a, a bunch of us all kind of meet to have you know have our uh, have our lunches together and we happened to have a county uh, animal control officer have lunch with us one night and and, and she starts telling me about this uh, odd scene that that she got called out on. Uh, somebody walked on, a, uh, walked up into an area and to understand the area where I'm at, uh, the big, the big problem right now and has been for years is pit bulls. People have pit bulls galore here. Uh, and there's a lot of them that actually just get dumped. So they go feral. And that's, right. that's an ongoing problem in the area I'm at. Well, she said somebody walked up on this scene where it was nothing but 
dead dog after dead dog after dead dog. Well, they're thinking they stumbled onto a, you know, a dog fighting thing because that's that's a one of the big sports around here is to have these illegal dog fights. Uh, so they call it in. She shows up, and she can't believe what she's seeing. And these ain't just dogs that are dead. These are dogs that are ripped apart. Uh, and How well, so? you know, uh, she told me one dog had its jaw absolutely. The lower jaw was ripped off its skull. Uh, dogs twisted in odd shapes. Um, uh, some of the dogs were actually missing forelimbs, hind limbs. Some of them were twisted at the torso, where the and laying on the ground where the their back legs were facing a totally di- different direction from their front legs. So, so this is all stuff that would not be the result exactly. of a dog fight. So uh, she calls it in, uh, saying, "Hey, look, we need to get." You know, I need to get another couple of animal control officers out here to help me clean this mess up and send a deputy. Well, within a short amount of time, there was all these three-letter agencies that showed up. Uh, and that's the one thing that DEA and FBI really kind of look look into is that when there, when there, where there's dog fights, there's, a, there's other illegal activity going on, drug dealing, that kind of stuff. Right, probably it. Yeah, I was just thinking that probably an indicator of uh, you know exactly drug dealers cartel and, and so. Anyways, uh, she wasn't there maybe an hour, and they they basically told her she had to leave. They were taking over the scene, and she wasn't welcome. So you know, she didn't wow. think about it. You know, she's like, "Oh, well, whatever, knock yourself out." Um, sure. And she's telling me about it. So you know, I I told you about it, and then I turn around right. and say, "You know." I want to find out more about this. I want her to take me to it. Well, when I called her back, she wouldn't even she would wouldn't go into any details about it. She just said, "I've been told not to talk about it." And I'm like, well, now that's interesting. I mean, why not discuss with another police officer about exactly. the dead dogs? You know, what 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 are they trying to cover up here? So, uh, within uh, oh, probably just a couple of days. Uh, I get called into the office uh, because I drove past that place a couple of times and and uh, I get called into the office and, you know, it's my chief and he's like, uh, I want to introduce you to these two guys. And, and one guy was, I don't want to say he was a biker per se because that's... A little, maybe a little rougher yeah, around the edges. Yeah, you could tell he was, he was not used to... Uh, being in a in a suit or anything like that and wouldn't wear one he was okay you know he was basically a little uh little more casual or a little more work attired uh, kind of an exactly. outdoorsy sort of person and the other one was a little more clean clean cut clean shaven uh more of the polo type shirt type of guy uh and basically they sure. told me i need to cease and desist now, this is yeah. just about dogs. So, uh, they want to know what uh, so who, what my interview with the, the older couple had, had uh, come out with. And I you know, I said, well, you know, I don't know what business it is of yours. That's totally unrelated call. Right. Uh, well, we want to know. So, it, it, it got to the point where the, you know, my alpha male tendencies kind of started to kick in. And, uh, you know, we got to the point where we were, we were almost to blows right there in front of my chief. And, uh, now, now let me ask you real quick, who did these guys now? They, they identified themselves as working. They for worked who? for the, uh, basically they said they worked for the department of the interior. So, okay. uh, so it makes you wonder why the department of the interior is there asking you about a disturbance call and some dogs exactly were killed. exactly that seems very out of out of out of place out of character to me. yeah well i was just it was odd you know it and you know they they showed creds and it wasn't like i i really spent a whole lot of time kind of memorizing their creds uh, but you sure. know i'm just kind of looking at it and you know, and then one thing led to another, and then we're, we're at each other's throats. They're telling me I need to stop doing what I'm doing. I'm like, no, 
I don't take orders from you. I take orders from that man. Uh, so that didn't go over well. And then uh, shortly thereafter, uh, a friend of mine had told me about a boy that had gotten thrown off his bike, for lack of a better way of putting it, on his way home. Um, basically, yeah. yeah, I know. I know when we talked, that was a, that's a fast. Yeah, story. And, and you know, his kid's on his way home. He's taking the back roads back home, and there's not a whole lot of street lamps in that area. And, and he stops, and he just had that feeling something was watching him. Well, he turns around and looks, and there's this damn thing right behind him. So. Now, you told me it was on yes. all fours, but it was already taller yes. than he was. Yeah. Well, that's enormous. Now, he's seeing this because he's under. Yeah, there's, there's not. Lights, I mean, right? the only place they put street light, lights in the, in, on that road is where they have turns and, and uh, bends in the road. Uh, so, you know, he, I mean, he's standing on the bike and he turns around and looks, there's this thing and uh, he tries taking off and the damn thing just, it was like one whole solid motion. Uh, and it just grabs the back of his bike and shoots him forward. Uh, and he gets up and he just hauls butt home. He's running at this point. Well, he, he made the report. His parents were concerned. Um, buddy of mine goes out and looks and, and finds the bike about nine feet in the tree and the you know he took he took the yeah kid he back took him out, to the right? exact spot and, and that's where he's looking and uh, you know up in the tree there's his bike and it's you know it's pretty well mangled so you know <laughs> that's incredible yeah you know, i'm listening to my buddy and i'm like what the hell's going on and now he's he's another yeah exactly he's deputy sheriff for uh, for this county that I'm I work in and okay. Uh, okay so you know he's telling me about it and he he said do you feel comfortable about going out with me I said sure and then of course we went out that following weekend and I, and I recall this because you were texting me as this these events were exactly. unfolding <laughs> so um, anyways. Uh, we're out there, we're at the same spot, and all of a sudden we see in this field, at the spot where the bicycle incident happened, we see a bunch of eye shine. And we're, yeah, right this at is night. at night. And and we're looking out there and we're like, you know, that could be illegal aliens out there, you know, because we're on the border. And uh, mm -hmm. about that time, you know, of course I'm texting you what's going on, and I'm like, yeah, we see eye shine. Well, the damn thing roars at us. We haul an ass at that point. So you, yeah, you told me you had this, what you think was the alpha male within five yeah, feet of I the mean, back it, of the cruiser. It was so loud. It shook the cab of the, of the patrol vehicle. So. And, and, and the poor deputy. No, no. Well uh, uh, he, he had a, he had a minor accident. Um, he's not proud of it. Uh, I told him, I said, you know, uh, adrenaline and fear has got a unique habit of making you lose your continence. And, and you know this from having exactly. combat. So, uh, you know, we go up to the Denny's and get him calmed down. Well, that following day, you know, I'm called back in the office and getting reamed out. <laughs> uh, basically being told that, you know, if I don't stop, I'll lose my job. I ended up getting suspended. Now this is just exactly. the chief telling you this, right? Well, and those you know two okay. cats were there, you know, and they're oh they were they were present. Oh, that's right. Now you told me they they had, they video had been of present, us. so they were there watching you guys and these exact watches, and actually filming exactly. what's going on. How did how did you? Well, react he, to this? he wasn't real happy. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it, the big thing was he wanted to find out what the hell was really going on. You know, and I don't blame him. In his, th this is his town. This is his district. You know, don't. Eat now, now, listeners should know too. It's a relatively exactly, small town, exactly. right? Um, so, so that's why you would have activity. You know, like like the first call you went on uh, with the older couple, uh, 
Uh, you know, a Sasquatch isn't going to walk into the middle of a big city, but a smaller town, you know, certainly. Oh, exactly. Edges. And that's that's what's so wild about this whole mess is that uh, it's totally unexpected because we're not we're not that far from a pretty good sized city. Uh, right. And that's that's the one thing that had it everybody up <clears throat> so kind of unnerved about this is that we were so close to a bigger city that you know right. I, I'd actually had right. friends say there's no way and I'm like well you know we we got a lot of open land and a lot of a lot of BLM land not not far from us so it wouldn't be that hard for them to to hide sure so these two men also now they threatened. Oh, they threatened the chief us. with having with having federal funds. Exactly, they threatened the account, to take right? our uh, take our. Uh, uh, they're called grants, you know, or federal law enforcement grants. Threatened to have them revoked. So uh, we don't get a, a lump sum; we get disbursement over the the time period of the of the grant. Uh, sure, but it but it certainly helps support exactly. the uh, police force. Exactly. And, uh, you know, without these, this grant money, we would have had a real hard time doing our jobs. Uh, at at least somewhat yeah. efficiently and, and uh, without much hardship on, on people. And that's the one thing we couldn't afford to lose. So, you know, at that point, I got, I got suspended for four or five days. And, and uh, you know, basically, you know, my boss is like, just chill out take some time off you're not in any kind of real trouble uh you didn't do anything wrong you didn't do anything i wouldn't have done so right but just cool cool your heels uh, for a little bit <laughs> yeah yeah cool your and, heels uh, for a little bit. but they went one step further i mean they even brought it up to the mayor and oh and the, right? you know the mayor got involved and you know we're trying to explain to the mayor like you know what uh, we answered to the city council, but we don't have to, any active investigation, we don't have to tell you about. Uh, that's none of your affair. And, of course, that didn't sit well with the mayor as it is anyways, because she's kind of a busybody, and she wants to know everything that's going on. And, that, you know, and I get that, but in the same token, I'm like, you know, I don't have to explain to you what we're doing. Right, you don't want an investigation. Exactly, with. and that's the that's the one thing that uh, <clears throat> that really started the I guess the ball of wax rolling for the the down downward spiral of the end of that department because that was it was after that it just everything had kind of changed you know the the attitude towards the police department with the city council and everything just spiraled out of control but. Uh, so you had you actually had your own close encounter? Yeah, uh, no, that was that that, right? uh, that Thanksgiving night. I was out on patrol, getting another, uh, you know, uh, domestic disturbance, uh, suspicious prowler, and, and show up. Uh, so you know, I go out there, and it's it's an older woman. Uh, I bet she's probably in her mid to late seventies, early eighties. Uh, mm -hmm. Show up. Uh, she's on the front step. She said, I think he's in the back. So I go to one side of the house and look, and, uh, there's no way to, to even make a passage there, uh, going to her backyard, uh, big stone fence. So I go around the other side of the house and, and make my way around. And I have a, I have a, uh, a, a tactical 45, 1911 that I carried and, uh, and you know the the surefire tack lights that are attached to the bottom bottom part of the frame. Well, I make it around the corner towards the backyard, and there it is. And I'm not maybe ten or fifteen feet from it. Uh, and Lord. of course, yeah, you know, I'm a big man. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm six foot tall. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm looking at his midriff. And, Good you know, I, I move the pistol up, and as I'm moving it up, I'm almost at a, you know, almost like a 45 to a 50 degree angle before I even hit the bottom, of, you know, the top of his chest. And that's right. when the, the log got flung at me. Uh, and it was a pretty good-sized log. It was, you know, 
it's yeah. threw a chunk of wood at you. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of standing there and, and it just barely missed my head. And, and uh, I start backing up. And about that time, I hear something behind me. And the, the first thought that, that ran through my mind was, oh, shit, there's two of them. Uh, I turn right. around, it's a fucking dog. <laughs> oh lord <laughs> well i look back to where he was and he's gone he's already making his way out into the you know out into the desert and, and uh right you know uh, gave him just enough time to to get the hell out of dodge um and uh so you know the next day i file my report and, and uh call you and tell you what happened and you know, I'd taken pictures of the of the log, and um, and then right. shortly thereafter, I had a couple more run-ins with those guys. Where uh, at one point, I you know, I caught them running code, what we call running code, um, doing excessive speed limits, and uh, you know, uh, having your lights on. Well, they were running code, right. but they didn't have their lights on, so you know. Yeah, well, I pulled them speeding. over. I knew who they were because you know that was probably not a, a smart move on my part. And, and uh, <clears throat> you know, I jump in the back seat and and I'm I'm sitting there talking to them. I'm like, you know, guys, I can help you more than hurt you. You know, just tell me what the hell's going on. You know, let's work together. And the uh, the big burly guy just wasn't having it, and and the other guy was. He was more polite, but he was he was a little more curt as well. Um, sure. And he's like, well, this is beyond your your pay grade. And I'm like, you'd be amazed what I'm used to and what my pay grade can do and what it can do. <laughs> <laughs> and besides, you're yeah. in your town. Uh, so. And I'm like, you know, I don't want to write you a ticket because yeah. I know you're going someplace important. But, uh, you know, let me help you. You know, if we help each other, then then this maybe we can resolve this. And it was uh, nothing doing. But within a you know a very short time period, uh, they had actually showed up to my office, and uh, basically uh, you know threw a packet on my desk and said, "You want to help? Here you go." And uh, essentially, we're offering you a job. And I'm like, mm. and there was some material in there I'm not going to discuss. Right. And what's interesting about this for our listeners is, now, while I, I don't necessarily believe in any sort of conspiracies, uh, we know that the feds yeah. are involved in this. And we know that because of people like you who are uh, police officers who have had direct contact. And I remember you actually photographed their cruiser yeah, and yeah. ran the plates and the plates came back yep. to the department of Homeland security. So this is, this is direct correlation. Now I, I understand I'm sure they have a, a very tough job, so I'm not going to out these fellows uh, or cause them problems. So uh, we don't really have to go into any further about that. Um, just that, you know, this did happen in, in, you're a very credible. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the thing. So, just so you people know, know it's, this. and since then it's been kind of snowballing uh, in other directions. But uh, you know, there's there's been some other instances. I actually wanted to go over a couple of those because I, I think listeners would find them fascinating. Uh, let's let's talk about a few of those. The first one that really uh, it was it, it's comical, but it's not comical. Was the uh, uh, the acquaintance of yours, who was the Apache working okay. on the ranch and the incident he had in the barn one night? Uh, I ran into a, a guy I know, and he's he's telling me about it. Uh, he worked on Mescalero Reservation as a cowboy and and uh, for different, you know, other ranchers in the area that uh, would employ him. And that's unfortunate because that this guy is really good. He's very talented in what he does. Uh, but, you know, they were out doctoring steers and and working cattle and you know at the end of the day like most cowboys do they all get to drinking beer and he didn't want to go driving anywhere so he decided he's going to go sleep in the hayloft to this barn uh you know in the middle of the night he feels something hit his foot and he's and he hears something he's like okay you know these guys are playing playing jokes so uh he was just going to go ahead and, and 
he had that cattle prod next to him that had been using all day long. Grabbed that cattle prod, and hit his foot again, and he he launched up and he jabbed. And when he jabbed, he pushed down on the button on the cattle prod, and there's a little button on the handle. Uh oh. Well, <laughs> apparently he nailed one of these things right dead center in the chest, and basically threw him off the the ladder. You know, it's probably about ten or twelve feet up. So the Sasquatch is actually climbing the ladder and yeah. messing with his foot. And he oh, yeah. It with well, that's prod. when that's when the rodeo started. <laughs> Now he was he was tending some sick exactly, cattle. Exactly. Well, it, <laughs> was is the key operative word here. <laughs> right. Well, that's why I wanted to mention it. So, it sort of uh, gives context for. So, anyways, say. this thing's just raising hell, and it's uh, it, it's tearing the barn down, and so he ends up, you know, he's waiting for it to to you know climb up back into the loft with him, and and you know he's got the cattle prod it's ready and then he starts hearing you know attacking the animals well that's when he went out the back window of the hayloft jumped out and ran to his pickup hauled ass well when he got back out there there's a bunch of those three letter agencies floating around to include forestry service and and uh, and uh department of the interior and he went in the barn and and there was like four or five steers that had been sick that they'd been treating with with uh LA 200 which is an antibiotic uh they were dead so uh you know he he said don't let anybody tell you that these things don't exist and he said I'm the first one to tell you they do said, well I already believe so you know an experience and there and there was another incident with a uh a person you know and this was another fascinating one too with his yeah. finger um and the this individual has a there's two parts to the story. The in order to tell you that part, I got to tell you what what preceded that. Uh, sure. Apparently, uh, this guy lives not too far from that area, uh, within about sixty seventy miles. Anyways, um, he's got a what we call a hard scrabble scratch ranch is all it is. It's uh, it's out in the middle of the the Tularosa Basin. Uh, he's he's out there. He's tending his livestock, um, and he's watering his tomato plants. And he turns around, and there's one standing right behind him. Well, it scared him so bad that he squirts it with a water hose. You or I get squirted with a water hose, and we're pissed. Uh, right. Just imagine that was probably the same reaction this thing had. Like I, like I told you, I'd gotten a call at, at like 6.30 in the morning, and I was already on my way to a uh, to a job up north. And so, you know, I was in the area, just happened to be, you know, just by uh, serendipity, I just happened to be in that, that location. So I, I rolled into the hospital and and went and seen John, and, and uh, he looked rough, and of course he told me the whole story about what had happened. Now he woke up at like, like uh, 2 two o'clock in the morning, and it, what woke him up was a really wretched smell. Is what woke him up, and uh, he said, you know, at first it was like this bad smell, and and it had this feeling that something was standing over top of him. And he just happened to look, and there, there this thing was, looking down at him, and that's when, you know, all the fun started. It it had gotten inside of his house. Yeah, it it had, it had come into the house. Uh, so did he say how what happened? I mean, I am sure he did. Uh, well, you know, he said what he could remember was is a, you know, the thing just started pummeling him the minute he looked at it, um, and uh, through the whole melee. Uh, he remembers getting picked up and thrown at, at a wall. Now, this is a man that's, that's almost in his seventies. Now this, so, now he got his, he got a finger bit off too, yeah, right? Yeah. How, how so, did that happen? And, and the only thing that we could figure out is, and he said, as he's trying to, to keep from getting hit, the thing grabs his hand is the only thing that we could figure out. And it bit his hand, uh, bit his finger off. Good Lord. And it bit it right off at the knuckle. 
So, you know, uh, of course, the other doctor there is like, uh, that was a bear attack. all it was. You know, it happens all the time. And I'm like, no, I've seen bear attacks. This isn't even remotely close to a bear attack. I mean, he doesn't have you know claw marks on him. None. Uh, no open lacerations or wounds other than, you know, the obvious right there. Uh, bears have carnassial molars, which is flesh tearing molars or, or flesh shearing molars, uh, where we have molars that crush and, and like a horse or a, or a cow. Um, and the, this doesn't look like it was sheared off. This looks like this was crushed off. And he's like, well, you know, you're not a doctor. You wouldn't know. So I, I didn't want to get into a pissing contest with the doctor over it. Sure. So. You know, after I got done consoling with John, I said, look, I'm going to go out to your place uh, and check out what happened. And he goes, okay. He said, uh, he said, uh, you know, of course he told me he woke up at like 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. Or no, it was earlier than that because I got to call at 6.30. So I, I guess he had to wake up at 6. And he hadn't been in the hospital but about 45 minutes when I showed up. Anyways, uh, he, uh, he, he he got knocked out by being thrown into a wall, yeah. and then it apparently left him alone, right? Yeah, after that, it kind of left him alone. Did he, you see what the condition of the house was? I mean, did it just leave? or No, no, that's where the second part comes in. Okay. okay. So, anyways, I show up, and lo and behold, there's one of my buddies that, that who will remain nameless. Uh, <laughs> because he's... What, one of the two gentlemen. Yes, one of my, my two favorite gentlemen. Um... And he, he kind of smiled. And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, you know, this is one of my friends. And he goes, uh-huh. And so, anyways, I said, uh, you mind if I go in and look? And he goes, no. But he said, uh, give me your phone. I don't want you taking any pictures. And I called some friends up in the in the area and said, hey, look, will you go out there with me? And they said, sure. And they met me out there. And, uh, and he said, your buddies can't go in. Wow. Okay. So you know, my buddy is is uh, he's he's protecting his job, and I understand that. Sure. Uh, but and he he probably went out on a limb allowing me in there. So I go in there, and uh, the house looks like it, you know, a tornado went through it. There's a probably about a hundred fifty year old china cabinet that's that's absolutely pulled down, and. It's in, it's in a, it's probably seen its better days after that event. Uh, the one thing I noticed was, is that the inside of the house smelt like urine, horrible urine. Wow. Um, you know, my, my speculation, I have no proof of this. I don't know. My speculation is, is during the frenzy, either it was urinating to claim dominance. Very possible. Or, uh, because it was so excited that uh, maybe possibly it was throwing off a, a scent that that is an oily scent that doesn't go away easily. Right, and both are very strong possibilities. You know, as far as John, you know, he's a bachelor. He's, he's been, uh, he's got kids. Uh, they're all grown. His, uh, you know, his oldest son lives in town. He's been a bachelor for probably, I don't know, maybe... 25, 30 years. And he's, you know, he lives a bachelor's lifestyle. He's not, uh, he's not immaculate, but he's not a sure. pig. And I've been in his house before and it's never looked like that. And his bedroom really looked like it was, it was absolutely a shambles. And you could tell where he, where he got thrown up against the wall. So, you know, I, I come out and I kind of look and, and my buddy's, but he's just standing there smiling at me, and and uh, and I said, "Well, we both know what happened." He goes, "Yeah." So uh, I said, "You sure you won't let me take take my camera in there?" And he goes, "No, no, we're not going to let you have any pictures." <laughs> so. Now you now for listeners, you and this gentleman uh, that you talked about earlier had <laughs> discussions in in depth about all this stuff. Yeah. So that's why he more or less allowed you to go in and, and was talking on a, on a somewhat friendly basis. Exactly. Well, at one point he was 
for lack of a better term, was trying to recruit me um, to uh, to a specific uh, occupation that that deals in this subject matter. Um, and to this day, I still I really don't know. My 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 only guess is that it's a a subset group of the Department of the Interior, uh, right? And, uh, in combination with Department of the Agriculture, um, because it, it seems like they're they're it, it's a combination of all kinds of things. But these are are a select few that have a specific skill set that uh, tend to be recruited in these matters for long term employment. Let me ask you a question: Did he ever? I mean, in the process of attempting to recruit you for uh, their, for lack of a better term, organization. Uh, did he ever say why the government was trying to deal with this and not talk about it publicly? Well, we got into that subject matter a little bit. His his verbiage was, if you understand my meaning, our concern is economics. In, in terms of a liability issue? Uh, well, and that's all he said was economics. You know, our concerns are economics. And I'm sure that could mean a lot of different things. Exactly. Com- combined. My my theory is, is that it just doesn't affect liability issues. Uh, it also tiptoes around, you know, our, our outdoor recreational uh, expenses. It's a big industry. Or, or industry is in the billions of dollars every year. Uh, I know for a fact because I worked for the the uh, an organization that that belongs to the Department of the Interior last summer. Uh, just uh, you know, as a uh, an internship job because I needed college credit for it. They had a record year last year, mainly because it was the the centennial and and more people are using these recreational resources like uh, National Park Service, uh, Bureau of Land Management, uh, Army Corps Engineer Parks. They use these, and and these entities collect money. Well, to say that there's a threat out there, uh, a distinguishable threat. And, and I guess to, to put a fine point on it, and tell me if I'm, I'm on the mark with this, based on your discussions with him, uh, these things, number one, are not very nice creatures. No. Secondly, when these gentlemen come into a location, it's because things have been happening, you know, with these creatures that have gone beyond a certain threshold. Well, yeah, exactly. And, it, and then if the public were to find out that's what was really going on, that level of aggression, uh, no one would that be in the that outdoors was. anymore. And so that's pretty much it, yeah. right? And that, that was, uh, you know, of course, you know, like I said, I, I, sometimes I got more balls and brains. Probably my, my brightest moment and, and not my smartest moment was when I, I pulled him over for, for running code without, you know, having, <laughs> having certain uh, apparatuses or equipment turned on. And this was after you basically were threatened by exactly. that, correct? Uh, yeah. After- so it was sort of a little payback kind of a tit for tat yeah and, and but you know what that actually kind of worked in my benefit in in the long run because i think i garnished a little bit of respect from them well you were able to establish a dialogue i, I know you and i have talked quite a bit about this you were able to sta- actually establish a dialogue after that day exactly uh, and and a very constructive dialogue as, as opposed right. to being adversarial uh prior to that and uh to the degree where they would Openly admit certain things. Uh, other things they they would tiptoe around, and, and that was the one thing that uh, that that individual had told me. He said they're not uh, these things are these creatures are extremely dangerous. They're not always a threat to us, but when they do become a threat, that's when it becomes a very uh, tenuous situation at best. And, and for listeners, I think it's important to understand too. It's not black and white. I mean. Sasquatches are not all one way, or they're not all the other way. It sort of depends on it depends on a lot of factors. I mean, you know, between each group and individual, there's uh, all sorts of, I suppose, underlying 
for lack of better term, psychological conditions that would affect their behavior, including age, diet, all those kinds of things, disposition of a group, and so on. Me and you've discussed that, but uh, me and this individual didn't discuss it to that length. We we just, you know, his his he was very very noncommittal on certain certain aspects of the subject matter. Well, plus he knew you were going to talk to me, so. <laughs> yeah, you know, and there's been a few occasions where we, we knew that our phone was being tapped when we were talking, so. Sure, right. Um, and now, I, I want to say this, so if they're listening, we're not out to out them. No, absolutely. Well, no. and I think he I think he realizes that now. Uh, just right. for the sheer fact that he allowed me to go into the scene. I, I, th- I actually think they do a vital service. I, I think they need to be a little more open about it, but uh, you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna out them to, to force them to become open. No, and I, I would never put information out that would compromise them, you know, for the sake of getting more listeners or anything like that. I, I think because they have a tough job, and I'm sure it's not them who are setting the rules. Exactly, and that's and of course you know well. I, I, I say that that was part two, me going into that house. Part two is okay. when, I, when I finally made contact, because I lost contact with John for, what was it, a month and a half? Yeah, it was very interesting. What what happened after this now? Uh, when I finally did make contact with John, I, got, I finally got a hold of his son, uh, very cryptic in, in his responses to me about how his father was doing. All he said was, my father's fine. Uh, we'll talk to you soon, someday. Well, shit, that's kind of really non-committed. Right. Now, you went out to the house again, though, didn't you? Yeah, here, here just, a, a, you know, like a month or so ago I did. And what did you find? Uh, basically, the whole place is cleaned up. You wouldn't, uh, th- there's not even really a house there anymore, or what used to be the house. That's gone. The barn. House, outbuildings, yeah, everything was is vanished. It's leveled. leveled. When I finally did make contact with John, where I could kind of pin him down, uh, he absolutely would not talk about the subject. Wow. Uh, now that's pretty telling, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and I, you know, the, my understanding now, his land now belongs to one of the three-letter agencies, the aforementioned agencies that, that we had just discussed. Um, right. And... Uh, do you know if they purchased it or did they just take it? Uh, well, I I think they had to purchase it, but it was kind of a strong arm purchase. You're taking this whether you want to or not. <laughs> That's very interesting. I mean, I, I'm not sure even what to say about that. I mean, that sort of speaks for itself. Well, and, and here's my theory on this. Because this has been a, an, a, a true habituation, uh, not of his own design, but just by sheer happenstance and, and accident. Um, that uh, I think they seen a threat that wasn't going to go away. Right. Uh, and the best thing to do is to to get all uh, civilians out of that area or people that they and, knew were were in, and probably to remove whatever was attracting the creatures to that location. Exactly. You know, thus removing the house and outbuildings and everything, sort of erasing. Yeah, it. yeah, and just now I. I since I've started working for uh, one of those aforementioned agencies uh, part time, just to get some extra scratch, my office actually controls that general area where John's ranch was. Uh, so I'm 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 guessing. I don't know for certain, but I'm thinking that it's that agency. Uh, what land we own? Um, <coughs> excuse me. What land that this agency owns? I mean, all I got to do is pull up. Uh, a grid coordinate or a Google map of the area and say, is that private land or is that public lands now? And, uh, you know, take that to the, to the real estate guys. And they'll say, Oh no, that's ours. One of the, uh, the areas that I thought belonged to the city where I live, uh, I actually pointed out a historical spot to our archeologist. And, uh, he goes, no, no, that doesn't belong to, to the city of, of, XYZ that that actually belongs sure. to us. That's our, you know, that's public lands. And I said, well, yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, we need to go put a historical marker down there because that's that's a pretty significant spot. 
uh, in a uh, you know an event in American history happened there. We need to to recognize that. And he goes, ah, you know, I didn't think about that, but you're right. <laughs> well, we're just about out of time. We're gonna have to uh, we're gonna have to do another session, I think. And again, folks, you know, from uh, hearing this from a police officer, I think adds a lot more credibility. Not that a lot of people aren't credible, but I think because you know people in your position. Uh, just by the virtue of the nature of your job makes it much more uh, credible, you know, the things you've seen and, and are telling. Well, and that's, and that's always been my, my, my standard argument here of the last few years is that if you take out the Internet, uh, prior to the Internet becoming, an, uh, you know, a, a driving force in this subject matter, uh, because we can't, neither one of us can deny that the, the Internet plays a significant role in, in this subject matter now. But, Absolutely. Prior to that, if you take all the, the, the reported sighting, both to private citizens and public group, the people that make these these accusations are firefighters, police officers, EMT workers, uh, lawyers, doctors, jet propulsion engineers for NASA uh, that have everything to lose and nothing to gain from it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can give you an example. I have a friend who's with, uh, and I won't give away his name or position, but uh, in a position of authority with CAL FIRE with the state of California, and him and another person uh, of his position actually watched one of these creatures on a fire last summer uh, sneaking up on a food drop. And, uh, you know, they didn't really know what to think about the subject until they actually saw one of these things doing this. So uh, there are definitely, you know, people in official positions, just like regular folks, that are seeing these creatures. And, and it's not just average Joe that's making these these reports. It's like I said, it's, you know, when you've got civil servants and, and, Ab- and people of absolutely. high positions of trust in and and position that make these same accusations then you, you i mean you have no alternative but say okay there's something going on absolutely well listen we're out of time but let's plan to uh do another chat okay. and thanks for listening everyone and tune in for next week's episode thanks everyone for joining me this week be sure to tune in again next week as we explore another account from a witness of the unknown I've talked quite a bit, so I kind of want to start off with the, uh, you were on duty one night, uh, and this was just a couple of years ago, uh, with the, the older couple. Oh yeah, I got, I got called out on a, uh, on a suspicious person call, and it was a, it was an older couple, and uh, in their 80s, uh, show up to the house, uh, Guy, I guess that they had a they had a broken window is what woke them up. Uh, they go in the kitchen, see that they got a broken window, and there's a, there's a rock there. Well, they see movement, and of course, uh, the old man, it's old Hispanic gentleman, uh, tells his wife to call call nine one one, thinking somebody's trying to break into the house. Well, he goes out on the porch to to see if he can see who it is and uh i mean just gets out past the door and that's when he noticed the thing standing right there you know in front of his porch and uh it took a swipe at him uh and it just he said it just missed him by inches uh and when he started explaining it to me he said it can't be real it can't be real and i kind of look at him and like yeah it, it's real <laughs> Now you're thinking back to when exactly. you were a kid and your exactly. own experience, right? Okay. So, so now when you took, so you took that report. And what nothing happened really next? happened much after that uh, until after I was having a, a bunch of us all kind of meet to have you know have our uh, have our lunches together, and we happened to have a county uh, animal control officer have lunch with us one night, and. and and she starts telling me about this uh, odd scene that that she got called out on, 
uh, somebody walked on a uh, walked up into an area and to understand the area where I'm at, uh, the big the big problem right now and has been for years is pit bulls. People have pit bulls galore here, uh, and there's a lot of them that actually just get dumped, so they go feral. And that's right. that's an ongoing problem in the area I'm at. Well, she said somebody walked up on this scene where it was nothing but dead dog after dead dog after dead dog. Well, they thinking they stumbled onto a you know a dog fighting thing because that's that's a one of the big sports around here is to have these illegal dog fights. Uh, so they call it in. She shows up, and she can't believe what she's seeing. And these ain't just dogs that are dead. These are dogs that are ripped apart. Uh, at, uh, uh, CID group right there at Fort Campbell. And, and so I did, uh, one thing led to another within, uh, not even a, a week of talking to them. I was, uh, already transferred over to their, their MTO. I was on their books. They carried me as one of their, uh, augmentees. Uh, waiting a school date. Uh, so I spent the uh, better part of a month and a half, almost two months, uh, learning about CID agents from the agents themselves before I went to the school. And then I ended up going to Fort McClellan, uh, went through uh, CID school there before they closed McClellan down. Uh, after that, I ended up uh, doing a rotation in Korea, uh, came back, um, uh, did another rotation at Fort Campbell, ended up going to Fort Story, Virginia. Uh, I was the, I was the only resident, uh, CID agent on post. So, uh, not that we had, uh, infinite amounts of crime that was happening within the Virginia beach area, but, uh, every now and again, I get bored because not much happened on Fort Story. It was, it was about the, about the size of five city blocks. So I'd, I'd run down to Virginia Beach PD and, and carouse with them. I'd, I'd do a lot of uh, 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 concurrent jurisdictional work with them. Uh, now, uh, for, for listeners who don't know, you know, aren't familiar with the military, CID is, and I'll see if I, my memory is good, Criminal Investigative Division? That's it. Okay. That's it. Uh, then I ended up doing a rotation up at Fort Belvoir uh, as a uh, PSD agent. Uh, which is protective service detail. Uh, from there, I ended up uh, coming back to Virginia Beach, met my ex-wife. Um, uh, we got married there in, in Virginia, uh, and then we decided to move back to Texas, did a rotation at Las Colinas, did a rotation with the 425th CID uh, detachment out of uh, Grand Prairie. Uh, did a little bit of undercover work, but a lot of my uh, a lot of my expertise was protective service detail. Um, and that's what they like to do with uh, uh, certain detachments. Is they'll list them under uh, different battalions, and my detachment was uh, fortunately I was listed under the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the PSB battalion, which is protective service battalion. So uh, every about every year we get a we get a anywhere between a six week to a six month uh, protective service detail rotation we'd have to do and I'd I'd end up going back to Belvoir and, and spend six months there. Uh, did a rotation Your exactly own right. Okay. So So now when you took so you took that report and what nothing happened really next? happened much after that, uh, until after I was having a, a bunch of us all kind of meet to have you know, have our uh, have our lunches together, and we happen to have a county uh, animal control officer have lunch with us one night, and and, and she starts telling me about this uh, odd scene that that she got called out on. Uh, somebody walked on a uh, walked up into an area, and to understand the area where I'm at, uh, the big the big problem right now, and has been for years, is pit bulls. People have pit bulls galore here. Uh, and there's a lot of them that actually just get dumped. So they go feral. 
And that's right. that's an ongoing problem in the area I'm at. Well, she said somebody walked up on the scene where it was nothing but dead dog after dead dog after dead dog. Well, they thinking they stumbled onto a you know a dog fighting thing because that's that's a one of the big sports around there is to have these illegal dog fights. Uh, so they call it in. She shows up and she can't believe what she's seeing. And these ain't just dogs that are dead. These are dogs that are ripped apart. Uh, and, How well, so? you know, uh, she told me one dog had its jaw, absolutely, the lower jaw was ripped off its skull. Um, dogs twisted in odd shapes. Um, uh, some of the dogs were actually missing forelimbs, hind limbs. Some of them were twisted at the torso where the, and laying on the ground where the, their back legs were facing a totally di- different direction from their front legs. So, so this is all stuff that would not be the result exactly. of a dog fight. So, uh, she calls it in, uh, saying, Hey, look, we need to get, you know, I need to get another couple of animal control officers out here to help me clean this mess up and send a deputy. Well, within a short amount of time, there was all these three letter agencies that showed up. Uh, and that's the one thing that DEA and FBI really kind of look, look into is that when there, when there, where there's dog fights, there's a, there's other illegal activity going on, drug dealing, that kind of stuff. Right. Probably. Yeah. I was just thinking that probably an indicator of, uh, you know, exactly. drug dealers cartel. And, and so anyways, uh, she wasn't there maybe an hour and they, they basically told her she had to leave. They were taking over the scene, and she wasn't welcome. Uh, in the middle of the night, broke down. Uh, so, you know, they weren't that far from town, uh, and it was within walking distance. Well, something happened to the woman that knocked her out, and a little boy got chased into a culvert. Oh, and, uh, you know, now that I'm older, I kind of think about it and of course that little boy was he was cut up pretty good um sure because all kinds of garbage gets trapped in a in you know water runoff culverts and, uh, right now right. that i'm older and i think about it i'm like something had you know by the grace of god that the kid's lucky he didn't get bit by a snake yeah because oh, culverts are just uh, they're notorious for having <clears throat> rattlesnakes and water moccasins in them well, apparently when a deputy sheriff was driving past, seeing the car broke down, and then seeing the woman alongside the road like she was passed out, woke her up. She's in hysterics. Where's my little boy? Where's my little boy? And it took them a couple hours to find him, but they found him in that culvert. But he was he was pretty well cut up. And my aunt was my aunt yeah. worked at the, in the ER as a nurse and. And uh, when they brought that little boy in, she's like, okay, there's something to what the story that these boys told me. Because this just isn't right. You know, nobody's going to chase a little boy did, in the middle of the night. Yeah. Did, do you think they may have told her some more details? That yeah. More did, about it? <clears throat> apparently the, the woman couldn't say much, but the little boy just kept saying a big hairy man and a big hairy hand tried to pull him out of the culvert. And the kid was in hysterics when they finally got him out of the culvert. Yeah, uh, and then the other thing that had happened was is that my aunt's neighbor had had some some. He was pretty well known uh, along the circles of of coon hounds. You know, he he raised black and tans and blue ticks. And uh, I mean, th- this is a guy that that would advertise in magazines like Full Cry, selling hounds to you know, everybody across the United States. Well, he had a, he had a, two broods that just mysteriously ended up disappearing. And these were, wow. you know, these weren't 18 week old pups. These were like five or six week old pups, but, but that was a lot of money for him. That's how he, you know, pretty much made his living outside of, I, I forget where he worked, like the gas company or something. Uh, and that was, uh, he ended up losing that. Uh, and that was a chunk of change for him to lose, you know, and these were some prize winning hounds that produced these two broods. And 
And and it, what woke him up was a really wretched smell is what woke him up. And uh, he said, you know, at first it was like this bad smell and, and it had this feeling that something was standing over top of him. And he just happened to look and there, there this thing was looking down at him. And that's when, you know, all the fun started. It, it had gotten inside of his house. Yeah, it, it, had, it had come into the house. Uh, so did he say how what happened? I mean, I am sure he did. Uh, well, you know, he said what he could remember was, is a, you know, the thing just started pummeling him the minute he looked at it. Uh, and uh, through the whole melee, uh, he remembers getting picked up and thrown at, at a wall. Now, this is a man that's, that's almost in his 70s. Now this so, now he got his he got a finger bit off too yeah, right yeah how, how so, did that happen and and the only thing that we can figure out is and he said as he's trying to to keep from getting hit the thing grabs his hand is the only thing that we can figure out and it bit his uh, bit his finger off good lord and it bit it right off at the knuckle so you know uh, of course the other doctor there is like. Uh, that was a bear attack. All it was, you know, it happens all the time. And I'm like, no, I've seen bear attacks. This isn't even remotely close to a bear attack. I mean, he doesn't have you know claw marks on him, none, uh, no open lacerations or wounds, other than you know the obvious right there. Uh, bears have carnassial molars, which is flesh tearing molars or or flesh shearing molars. Uh, where we have molars that crush, and, and like a horse or a or a cow, um, and the, this doesn't look like it was sheared off. This looks like this was crushed off. And he's like, "Well, you you're not a doctor, you wouldn't know." So I, I didn't want to get into a pissing contest with the doctor over it. Sure. So you know, after I got done consoling with John, I said, "Look, I'm gonna go out to your place uh, and check out what happened." He goes, okay. He said, uh, he said, uh, you know, of course he told me he woke up at like six 30, seven o'clock in the morning or no, it was earlier than that. Cause I got to call at six 30. So I I guess he had to wake up at six and he hadn't been in the hospital, but about 45 minutes when I showed up anyways, uh, he, he, he got knocked out by being thrown into a wall and then it apparently left him alone. Right. Yeah. After that, it kind of left him alone. Did you see what the condition of the house was? I mean, did it just leave or? No, no. That's where the second part comes in. Okay. okay. So hey, there's something to what the story that these boys told me, because this just isn't right. You know, nobody's going to chase a little boy did, in the middle of the night. Yeah. Did, do you think they may have told her some more details? That maybe yeah. More I did. About it? <clears throat> Apparently the, the woman couldn't say much, but the little boy just kept saying a big hairy man and a big hairy hand tried to pull him out of the culvert. Mm-hmm. And the kid was in hysterics when they finally got him out of the culvert. Yeah, uh, right. And then the other thing that had happened was is that my aunt's neighbor had had some... some he was pretty well known uh, along the circles of, of coon hounds. You know, he, he raised black and tans and blue tits. And, uh, I mean, th- this is a guy that that would advertise in magazines like Full Cry, selling hounds to you know everybody across the United States. Well, he had a he had a, two broods that just mysteriously ended up disappearing, and these were wow you know these weren't eighteen week old pups these were like five or six week old pups but. But that was a lot of money for him. That's how he, you know, pretty much made his living outside of, I, I forget where he worked, like the gas company or something. Uh, and that was, uh, he ended up losing that. Uh, and that was a chunk of change for him to lose. You know, and these were some prize winning hounds that produced these two broods and and uh, they're just gone. So, you know, that was a chunk of change for him. Yeah. At sure. that point, that's when my aunt decided to move back to South Texas. And, uh, you just too many things. Yeah, happening. it's it's too many things. And and the thing is, is that that year, I I, I distinctly remember that year, uh, because that was nineteen eighty. 
81. And we had a bad drought. Well, behind the dam of Lone Star Lake is a swamp. Used to be just a river bottom. Well, when they uh, mm -hmm. when they dammed up the the river, the, the they they basically created a, a giant swamp area. And uh, there's no telling what's behind that dam because it's just sure. miles and miles and miles of of river bottom that's that's now flooded. Uh, and it's created a bunch of swamp land that, you know, I've talked to several people that have been from that area and they, they said, yeah, it's, there's no telling what's behind that swamp. You, you love the and, and that's something, that's something locals don't know. Uh -uh, right? Absolutely not. And there's really no reason to, you know, it, it, Lone Star Lake's not a big lake. It's, it's more of a, uh, Water, you know, I, I'd actually had right. friends say there's no way. And I'm like, well, you know, we, we got a lot of open land and a lot of a lot of BLM land not, not far from us. So it wouldn't be that hard for them to, to hide. Sure. So these two men also, now they threatened oh, they the threatened chief us. with having with having federal funds. Exactly. They threatened the county, to take right? our, uh, take our uh, uh, they're called grants you know, or federal law enforcement grants threaten to have them revoked. So uh, we don't get a, a lump sum. We get disbursement over the, the time period of the, of the grant. Uh, sure. But it, but it certainly helps support the exactly. uh, police force. Exactly. And, uh, you know, without these, this grant money, we would have had a real hard time doing our jobs. Uh, at, at least Absolutely. somewhat yeah. efficiently and, and uh, without much hardship on on people, and that's the one thing we couldn't afford to lose. So, you know, at that point, I got I got suspended for four or five days, and and uh, you know, basically, you know, my boss is like, just chill out, take some time off. You're not in any kind of real trouble. Uh, you didn't do anything wrong. You didn't do anything I wouldn't have done. So, right, but. Just cool, cool your heels uh, for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool your and, heels uh, for a little bit. But they went one step further. I mean, they even brought it up to the mayor, and oh, and the, right? you know the mayor got involved, and you know we're trying to explain to the mayor like you know what uh, we answered to the city council, but we don't have to any active investigation. We don't have to tell you about. It. Uh, that's none of your affair. And, of course, that didn't sit well with the mayor as it is anyways because she's kind of a busybody and she wants to know everything that's going on. And, you know, and I get that. But in the same token, I'm like, you know, I don't have to explain to you what we're doing. Right. You don't want an investigation. To exactly. With. And that's the that's the one thing that uh, <clears throat> that really started, the, I guess, the ball of wax rolling for the the down downward spiral of the end of that department because that was uh, it was after that it just everything had kind of changed you know the the attitude towards the police department with the city council and everything just spiraled out of control but uh, so you had you actually had your own close encounter yeah, uh, no that was that that, right? uh, that Thanksgiving night I was out on patrol getting another uh, you know uh, domestic disturbance. Uh, suspicious prowler and, and show up. Uh, so, you know, I go out there and it's, it is where the main highway was. And this woman and her little boy uh, in the middle of the night broke down. Uh, so, you know, they weren't that far from town uh, and it was within walking distance. Well, something happened to the woman that knocked her out and the little boy got chased into a culvert. Oh, and, uh, you know, and now that I'm older, I kind of think about it. And of course that little boy was, he was cut up pretty good. Um, sure. because all kinds of garbage gets trapped in a, in, you know, water runoff culverts. And, uh, right. Now right. that I'm older and I think about it, I'm like something had, you know, by the grace of God, the, the kid's lucky he didn't get bit by a snake. Yeah, because oh, culverts are just, uh, they're notorious for having rattlesnakes and water moccasins in them. Well, apparently when 
a deputy sheriff was driving past, seeing the car broke down, and then seeing the woman alongside the road like she was passed out. Woke her up. She's in hysterics. Where's my little boy? Where's my little boy? And it took them a couple hours to find him, but they found him in that culvert. But he was he was pretty well cut up. And my aunt was my aunt yeah. worked at uh, in the ER as a nurse. And and uh, when they brought that little boy in, she's like, okay, there's something to what the story that these boys told me because this just isn't right. You know, nobody's going to chase a little boy. Did in the middle of the night. Yeah. Do, do you think they may have told her some more details? That may yeah. More about it? <clears throat> Apparently the, the woman couldn't say much, but the little boy just kept saying a big hairy man and a big hairy hand tried to pull him out of the culvert. Mm-hmm. And the kid was in hysterics when they finally got him out of the culvert. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then the other thing that had happened was, is that my aunt's neighbor had, had some, some, he was pretty well known uh, along the circles of, of coon hounds. You know, he, he raised black and tans and blue ticks. And, uh, I mean, th- this is a guy that, that would advertise in magazines like Full Cry selling hounds to, you know, everybody across the United States. Well, he had, a, he had a, two broods that just mysteriously ended up disappearing. And these were, wow. you know, these weren't 18 week old pups. These were like five or six week old pups, but, but that was a lot of money for him. That's how he, you know, pretty much made his living outside of, I, I forget where he worked, like the gas company or something. Uh, and that was, uh, he ended up losing that. Uh, and that was a chunk of change for him to lose. You know, and these were, he was talking on a, on a somewhat friendly basis. Exactly. Well, at one point he was for lack of a better term, was trying to recruit me um, to uh, to a specific uh, occupation that, that deals in this subject matter. Um, and to this day, I still don't, I really don't know. My, my, my only guess is that it's a, a subset group of the Department of the Interior. Uh, right. Uh, in combination with Department of the Agriculture. Um, because it, it seems like they're, they're, it, it's a combination, of all kinds of things, but these are, are, a select few that have a specific skill set that, uh, tend to be recruited in these matters for long-term employment. Let me ask you a question. Did he ever, I mean, in the process of attempting to recruit you for, uh, their, for lack of a better term, organization, uh, did he ever say why the government was trying to deal with this and not talk about it publicly? Well, we got into that subject matter a little bit. His, his verbiage was, if you understand my meaning, our concern is economics. In, in terms of a liability issue? Uh, well, and that's all he said was economics. You know, our concerns are economics. And I'm sure that could mean a lot of different things. Exactly. Com- combined. My my theory is is that it just doesn't affect liability issues. Uh, it also tiptoes around. You know, our our outdoor recreational uh, expenses a big industry. Or, or industry is in the billions of dollars every year. Uh, I know for a fact because I worked for the the uh, an organization that that belongs to the Department of the Interior last summer uh, just, uh, you know, as a uh, an internship job because I needed college credit for it. They had a record year last year, mainly because it was the the centennial and, and more people are using these recreational resources like uh, National Park Service, uh, Bureau of Land Management, uh, Army Corps Engineer Parks, they use these, and and these entities collect money. Well, to say that there's a threat out there, uh, a distinguishable threat. And, and I guess to, to put a fine point on it, and tell me if I'm, I'm on the mark with this, based on your discussions with him, uh, these things, number one, are not very nice creatures. No. Secondly, when these gentlemen come into a location, it's because 
things have been happening. To service detail. Uh, from there, I ended up uh, coming back to Virginia Beach, met my ex-wife. Um, uh, we got married there in, in Virginia, uh, and then we decided to move back to Texas. Did a rotation at Las Colinas, did a rotation with the 425th CID uh, detachment out of uh, Grand Prairie. Uh, did a little bit of undercover work, but a lot of my uh, a lot of my expertise was protective service detail. Um, and that's what they like to do with uh, uh, certain detachments is they'll list them under uh, different battalions. And my detachment was uh, fortunately I was listed under the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the PSB battalion, which is Protective Service Battalion. So uh, every about every year we get a we get a anywhere between a six week to a six month uh, protective service detail rotation we'd have to do and I'd I'd end up going back to Belvoir and, and spend six months there uh, did a rotation in Iraq in 2003 did a rotation in uh, Iraq again in 2005 did a rotation in uh, Afghanistan in 2009 and 10. Uh, I was deployed uh, to uh, Desert Storm in, in 1990. They sent me back. My dad had gotten killed. Uh, and then in uh, 1993, I ended up doing a rotation over in uh, in uh, uh, Somalia. I was, uh, a matter of fact, I was on the airfield when uh, the Rangers were hit in Mogadishu. So... So it's fair to say you you've got a fair amount of uh, combat experience in exactly, mind. and and my rotation in uh, in Mogadishu was with Fifth Group. It wasn't with CID. Uh, my rotations in two thousand three and four, two thousand five and six, and two thousand nine and ten uh, was with CID. So uh, you know I've got uh, combat arms, combat time, and I've got combat service and support time which is that's what they list cid and and the mps is combat service and support right right so you you retired out of the army as a master sergeant and so you decided to carry on and and go into civilian police work. exactly uh and and it's kind of odd because i actually retired in 2008 uh with 21 years and some months and uh, within six months' time, I was recalled back to service. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know a few people that have been called. Yeah, back. and uh, and it was only supposed to be a one-year rotation. It ended up being three years because it got blown up in Afghanistan. So, uh, well, that's that there. Uh, and my cousin Forrest was just—he was tickled to death. He finally had you know two buddies to run around with, and, and you know between the frog gigging down at the dam at, at Lone Star Lake and. And, you know, just out there really kind of making fools out of ourselves at that young age, trying to have fun. Uh, you know, we decided one night that, you know, after dinner, we were going to go out and go gig frogs down by the dam. Uh, you know, when you gig frogs, you, you really got to do it at night because that's usually the best time to, to catch your bigger frogs. And so uh, <clears throat> we're walking down this road and, and on one side of us is a is a peach orchard on the other side is a is a hay field and and it's fenced off and it's uh this road kind of dead end in front of this general store uh, we're walking down towards the dam which is the opposite direction of the general store and and uh you know we, we get down a good piece and we kind of look over to this other pasture that's right next to this this peach orchard uh and it's you know it's full of cattle and and they're all kind of jumping around and raising hell kind of acting like young calves do and uh sure. you know we're kind of giggling you know what the hell's going on over there and then about that time that's when my my cousin Forrest stopped dead in his tracks and uh i brushed past him and kind of look at him and i said what the hell's the matter with you you know i thought maybe we were getting ready to walk up on a on a water moccasin or something and, and he he just pointed of course my brother Gerald Lee stopped dead in his tracks too and and what, where he pointed i kind of turned around and looked and i'm looking and and all of a sudden, you know, I see this shape. It was it was a pretty well lit night. It, it was a full moon. Uh, I could see this shape, and it didn't quite register at first. And then all of a sudden, this thing kind of stood up. 
and it kept going up and up and up and up. And uh, we weren't, but probably 30, 40 feet from it. Uh, wow. And it was, was, I couldn't get you any details, but I could tell it was hairy. It was really broad sure. at the shoulders. I mean, broader than two men put together. Uh, it didn't look like it had much of a neck. Uh, and it just stood there. And it was almost like it was standing kind of at a, a, like a wide stance. Like you'd see um, somebody that, that crouches down, you know, they're going to take a wider stance to support their weight. Well, it just sure. stood straight up from that. And, you know. Wow. You know, over the years, I've tried to do that. You know, and that that takes a tremendous amount of strength. Even when I was 190 pounds, that took a tremendous amount of strength to stand up without any assistance from that that crouching position. Uh, right, um, right. And it just stood. You meant also now they threatened. Oh, they threatened the chief us. with having with having federal funds. Exactly, they threatened the county, to take right? our uh, take our. Uh, uh, they're called grants, you know, or federal law enforcement grants, threaten to have them revoked. So uh, we don't get a, a lump sum. We get disbursement over the, the time period of the, of the grant. Uh, sure, but it, but it certainly helps support exactly. the uh, police force. Exactly. And, uh, you know, without these, this grant money, we would have had a real hard time doing our jobs. Uh at least Absolutely. somewhat yeah. efficiently and and uh, without much hardship on on people, and that's the one thing we couldn't afford to lose. So you know, at that point, I got I got suspended for four or five days, and and uh, you know, basically, you know, my boss is like, just chill out, take some time off. You're not in any kind of real trouble. Uh, you didn't do anything wrong. You didn't do anything I wouldn't have done. Um, right, but just cool, cool your heels uh, for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool your and, heels uh, for a little bit. But they went one step further. I mean, they even brought it up to the mayor, and oh, and the, right? you know the mayor got involved, and you know we're trying to explain to the mayor like you know what uh, we answered to the city council, but we don't have to any active investigation. We don't have to tell you about. It. Uh, that's none of your affair. And, of course, that didn't sit well with the mayor as it is anyways because she's kind of a busybody and she wants to know everything that's going on. And, you know, and I get that, but in the same token, I'm like, you know, I don't have to explain to you what we're doing. Right, you don't want an investigation. Exactly. With. And that's the that's the one thing that, uh, <clears throat> that really started to, I guess the ball of wax rolling for the the down downward spiral of the end of that department because that was uh, it was after that it just everything had kind of changed you know the the attitude towards the police department with the city council and everything just spiraled out of control but uh, so you had you actually had your own close encounter yeah, uh, no that was that that, right? uh, that Thanksgiving night I was out on patrol getting another. Uh, you know, uh, domestic disturbance, uh, suspicious prowler, and, and show up. Uh, so you know, I go out there, and it's it's an older woman. Uh, I bet she's probably in her mid to late seventies, early eighties. Uh, mm -hmm. Show up. Uh, she's on the front step. She said, "I think he's in the back." So I go to one side of the house to keep from getting hit. The thing grabs his hand is the only thing that we could figure out, and it bit his hand, uh, bit his finger off. Good Lord. And it bit it right off at the knuckle. So, you know, uh, of course, the other doctor there is like, uh, that was a bear attack, all it was. You know, it happens all the time. And I'm like, no, I've seen bear attacks. This isn't even remotely close to a bear attack. I mean, he doesn't have you know claw marks on him, none, uh, no open lacerations or wounds, other than you know the obvious right there. Uh, bears have carnassial molars, which is flesh tearing molars or or flesh shearing molars, uh, where we have molars that crush and, and like a horse or a or a cow. Um, 
And the, this doesn't look like it was sheared off. This looks like this was crushed off. And he's like, well, you, you're not a doctor. You wouldn't know. So I, I didn't want to get into a pissing contest with the doctor over it. Sure. So, you know, after I got done consoling with John, I said, look, I'm going to go out to your place uh, and check out what happened. And he goes, okay. He said, uh, he said, uh, you know, of course, he told me he woke up at like 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. Or no, it was earlier than that because I got to call at 6.30. So I, I guess he had to wake up at 6. And he hadn't been in the hospital but about 45 minutes when I showed up. Anyways. Yeah, he, uh, he, he, he got knocked out by being thrown into a wall yeah. and then it apparently left him alone, right? Yeah, after that, it kind of left him alone. Did you see what the condition of the house was? I mean, did it just leave or? No, no. That's where the second part comes in. Okay. okay. So anyways, I show up and lo and behold, there's one of my buddies that, that who will remain nameless uh, because he's. <laughs> one, one of the two gentlemen. Yes. One of my, my two favorite gentlemen. Um, and he, he kind of smiled and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, you know, this is one of my friends. And he goes, uh-huh. And so, anyways, I said, uh, you mind if I go in and look? And he goes, no, but he said, uh, give me your phone. I don't want you taking any pictures. And I called some friends up in the in the area and said, hey, look, will you go out there with me? And they said, sure. And they met me out there. And, uh, and he said, your buddies can't go in. Wow. Okay. So, you know, my buddy is, is uh, he's, he's protecting his job. And I understand that. Sure. Uh, but and he, he probably went out on a limb allowing me in there. So I go in there, and uh, the house looks like it, you know, a tornado went through it. There's a... And working as a, uh, a law enforcement investigator, both the military and then now as a police officer. So what's important about that is the things we're going to be talking about have a direct bearing on that. Well, that's true. Um, because a lot of people, when they when they have experiences with these creatures, uh, you know, as an investigator with this particular subject, I have to uh, I have to sort of put on different glasses and how I view what people tell me, you know, and then try to learn about their backgrounds and such. So I kind of have a better idea of where their perspective is on what it was they experienced. But yours is, is a very well and heavily trained and experienced background as an investigator so it's very important when someone like you talks about what they have seen and experienced because it's from a very well trained and experienced exactly. background exactly well and that's uh, that i think that's some of the problem with the the general naysayers they don't take into account that the a good portion of the people that are that are making these reports are people that have to pay attention to detail, uh, military, firefighters, uh, EMT technicians, uh, any sort of first responders. Yeah. You know, mainly first responders and they have everything to lose and nothing to gain. This is true. Yeah, exactly. Because that could be a, a professional death knell. Uh, you know, if, if say you were to go out and publicly talk about, uh, you know, the things you've seen and experienced, uh, you know, that could be uh, professional. Care. Yeah, exactly. And that's, uh, you know, it, it, there's a running joke within the military itself. You know, if, if you hadn't got the gallows humor after your first couple of years in the military, you, you'll get it shortly thereafter. And then there's a lot. Of yeah, this is true. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a whole lot of truth to that. So, so now, Let's move forward. Um, now, during the course of your, your police duties, uh, how did you first come into contact with the subject of Bigfoot? Well, I, really, the, the my first contact was when I was a, a young boy. I was about 13 years old. Uh, me and my younger brother, Gerald Lee, went to go spend a couple of weeks at my aunt's house up in uh, north central Texas. And, uh, you know, we, we go up there uh, and my cousin Forrest was just, he was tickled to death. He finally had, you know, two buddies to run around with and 
you know, between the frog gigging down at the dam at, at Lone Star Lake and, and, you know, just out there really kind of, you know, having, having certain, uh, apparatuses or equipment turned on. And this was after you basically were threatened by exactly. that, correct? Uh, yeah. After- so it was sort of a little payback kind of a tit for tat. Yeah. It, 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 but you know what? That actually kind of worked in my benefit in, in the long run. Cause I think I garnished a little bit of respect from him. Well, you were able to establish a dialogue. I, I know you and I have talked quite a bit about this. You were able to st- actually establish a dialogue after that day. Exactly. Uh, and, and a very constructive dialogue as, as opposed right. to being a- adversarial uh, prior to that. And uh, to the degree where they would openly admit certain things, uh, other things they, they would tiptoe around. And, and that was the one thing that, uh, that that individual had told me said they're not uh, these things are these creatures are extremely dangerous they're not always a threat to us but when they do become a threat that's when it becomes a very uh tenuous situation at best and and for listeners i think it's important to understand too it's not black and white i mean sasquatches are not all one way or they're not all the other way it sort of depends on it depends on a lot of factors i mean you know, uh, between each group and individual, there's uh, all sorts of, I suppose, underlying, for lack of a better term, psychological conditions that would affect their behavior, including age, diet, all those kinds of things, disposition of a group, and so on. Me and you've discussed that, but um, me and this individual didn't discuss it to that length. We we just, you know, his his he was very, very noncommittal on certain certain aspects of the subject matter. Well, plus he knew you were going to talk to me, so. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and there's been a few occasions where we, we knew that our phone was being tapped when we were talking, so. Sure, right. Um, and now, I, I want to say this, so if they're listening, we're not out to out them. No, absolutely. Well, right. and I think he I think he realizes that now. Uh, just right. for the sheer fact that he allowed me to go into the scene. I, I, th- I actually think they do a vital service. I, I think they need to be a little more open about it, but uh, you know I'm not gonna I'm not gonna out them to, to force them to become open. No, and I, I would never put information out that would compromise them, you know, for the sake of getting more listeners or anything no. like that. I, I think because they have a tough job, and I'm sure it's not them who are setting the rules. Exactly, and that's and of course you know well. I, I, I say that that was part two, me going into that house. Part two is oh, when, no. I, when I finally made contact, because I lost contact with John for, what was it, a month and a half? Yeah, it was very interesting. What what happened after this now? Uh, when I finally did make contact with John, I, got, I finally got a hold And the other guy was, he was more polite, but he was he was a little more curt as well. Um, sure. And he's like, well, this is beyond your, your pay grade. And I'm like, You'd be amazed what I'm used to and what my pay grade can do and what it can do. So, <laughs> and besides, you're yeah, in your town, uh, so. And I'm like, you know, I don't want to write you a ticket because yeah, I know you're going someplace important. But, uh, you know, let me help you. You know, if we help each other, then then this maybe we can resolve this. And it was uh, nothing doing, but. Within a you know a very short time period, uh, they had actually showed up to my office, and uh, basically uh, you know threw a packet on my desk and said, "You want to help? Here you go." And uh, essentially, we're offering you a job. And I'm like, mm. and there was some material in there I'm not going to discuss. Right. And what's interesting about this for listeners is. Now, while I, I don't necessarily believe in any sort of conspiracies, uh, we know that the feds yeah. are involved in this. And we know that because of people like you who are uh, police officers who have had direct contact. And I remember you actually photographed their cruiser yeah. and yeah. ran the plates. And the plates came back yep. to the Department of Homeland Security. So this is this is direct correlation. Now, I, I understand. I'm sure they have a, a very tough job. So... I'm not going to out these fellows uh, or cause them problems. So uh, we don't really have to go into any further about that. Um, just that, you know, this did happen and, and you're a very credible. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the thing. So, 
just so you people know, know it's this. and since then it's been kind of snowballing uh, in other directions. But uh, you know, there's there's been some other instances. I actually wanted to go over a couple of those because I, I think listeners would find them fascinating. Uh, let's let's talk about a few of those. The first one that really uh, it was it, it's comical, but it's not comical. Was the uh, uh, the acquaintance of yours who was the Apache working oh, on yeah. the ranch and the incident he had in the barn one night? Uh, I ran into a, a guy I know, and he's he's telling me about a, a he worked on Mescalero Reservation as a cowboy and and uh, for different you know other ranchers in the area that uh, would employ him, and that's unfortunate because that. This guy's really good. He's very talented in what he does. Uh, but, you know, they were out doctoring steers and, and working cattle. And, you know, at the end of the day, like most cowboys do, they all get to drinking beer. And he didn't want to go driving anywhere. So he decided he's going to go sleep in the hayloft of this barn. 